morning. When was the last time you cried? Perhaps it was a time when you were upset, or when you were hurt, or when you have lost a loved one. But the person we are going to study today is someone who wept and mourned for some days over people whom he has not met. Yes, we come to the book of Nehemiah, and we shall look at chapter 1. Now, the book of Nehemiah can be read as a sequel to the book of Ezra. The two books are considered as one book in the Hebrew Bible. Now, Nehemiah came to Jerusalem 13 years after Ezra and their paths cross when we come to Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, while Ezra was a priest, and a scribe or a scholar in the law of Moses, Nehemiah was only a Jew living in exile under the same time when the Persian Empire uh, was the, uh, the, 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 the uh, was in control of the area. Now, how much do we know of Nehemiah? Now, chapter one gives us the setting of the time, the place, and what Nehemiah does. The time, we are looking at the year 445 BC, which is the 20th year of the King Artaxerxes of Persia. The place, it is in a royal palace as Susa. Now this is a winter palace for the king. And uh, so what does he do? Nehemiah was a cup bearer to the king. In other words, he holds a very prestigious position and is much trusted by the king. And he was later made governor of Judah for a period for of 12 years, which we shall see in chapter 13, during which he carried out the rebuilding of the Jerusalem wall. And also he carried out the much needed social and spiritual reform of God's people in Jerusalem. Now, let us just have a brief recap to see what we are at. In the next slide, remind us that we are in the year 445 BC, which is the bottom line of the slide. It is 93 years since the decree of Cyrus, that is back in 500, 538, is the fourth line down. Remember, it was Cyrus who gave permission to all people to return to their homeland. So for the Jews, they can go back to Judah and live and worship as, as they do in their own tradition. And it is 70 years since the completion of the temple. Remember, the temple was completed in the year 515. So it is quite some time since the completion of the temple. And Ezra, as we saw last uh, two weeks ago, he returned to Jerusalem with some priests and Levites in the year 458. So it was 13 years ago that Ezra returned to Jerusalem. Now, so Nehemiah came to the scene. So both of them, a feature in the scripture under the same period when the Persian king, King Artaxerxes, was in power. So the next slide 
again reminds us the period under which the Persian king was overruling the entire region. On the furthest right column, you can see that it is during his reign of 464 to 423, right, that Ezra and Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem. It is also in that period that God spoke to his people through the prophet Malachi. Yes, Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament. And, uh, and uh, it is the last book uh, as we have in the scripture, in the, in the Old Testament scripture. Now it is through the ministries of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi that the remnants have kept their identity as God's people. And they have not returned to idols or foreign gods because of what these three people did in that period. So I believe God has much to say, not only to his people in those times, and also to us today. So today we are going to consider Nehemiah chapter 1 under the following three headings. One, we are, lo we are going to look at Nehemiah's concern. Why was he crying for God's people? Two, Nehemiah's confession. Yes, he was weeping, mourning, and prayed for a long time for God's people. Number three, we shall look at his commitment as a result of his concern for God's people and also God's honour in Jerusalem. He has decided to do something which is quite staggering. Okay, so let us look at the first one. Nehemiah's concern. Now in the beginning of the chapter, the first four verses tells us that the, this material is taken from Nehemiah's personal memoir. Although he was living in a royal palace, which is over 10,000 kilometers away from Jerusalem, he asked about the welfare of the remnants when he met his fellow brothers from Judah. In verse 2, Hananiah, one of my brothers, so it could be a Jewish brother or his own brother, but we do not know for sure. So these brothers came from Judah with some other men, and he questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. But the reply came as a shock to him, for they said, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. What a depressing picture. When Nehemiah heard this, he sat down and wept. For some days, he mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now, what do you think of his reaction? Well, his reaction is something that is coming out of his deep concern for his people. He wept. Weeping normally associates with a very deep emotional expression of grief. It's more than just crying more than just a few drops of tears coming down on our, uh, down to our cheek. He was mourning 
again, we mourn usually over the loss of someone that we care for dearly. So he wept and mourned for some days, right? So he was still in a prolonged state of weeping and grieving. And how long did it take him? We don't know for sure. But if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, then it would suggest to us that for a period of three to four months that he was in this state of weeping, mourning, and uh, praying over what he has heard. Now, what do you think of his reaction? Well, Nehemiah's concern for God's people was obvious. For it was him who asked the visitors from Judah about the welfare of the remnants who live more than a thousand kilometers away. He cares enough to ask not only about the remnants, which are his own people. His concern is because they are God's people. In other words, it's more than just because they are related by race. The remnants are God's people living in Jerusalem, God's land. So the focus is he is seeing that God's people is in disgrace and the pitiful condition of Jerusalem, which is God's place reflects God is not highly thought of in the eyes of the foreigners. It can't be because Jerusalem is the place of God and look at the state of it. It doesn't show any honor or, or glory to the God who claimed this is his place. Now, so what is the significance of Jerusalem? Now, Jerusalem is more than just a royal city of David. Yes, it remained as the capital of Judah for many years. But Jerusalem is also known as the place of dwelling for the Lord. It is the place where the temple was built. And if you look at verse 9, in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, this is how Nehemiah described this. So this is the place that God has chosen as a dwelling for my name. God associates himself with this place. Now, and in Jer uh, Nehemiah chapter 11, Jerusalem is described as the holy city. Now, so in the mind and of the Jewish people, Jerusalem is held highly as the city of God, as the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 64. It's a city of the Lord, sign of the Holy One of Israel. Again, I'm sure the words of Ezekiel will be ringing in the bells of the exiles. For God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, this is my place. This, sorry, this is the place of my throne and the place for my soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. Now, so through the prophecy given by Ezekiel in this vision, God is saying, look, this place, Jerusalem, is the place of my throne, right? Now, and and uh, so to the Israelites in the Old Testament, Jerusalem is where people find the glory of God. And this symbolism carries over to the New Testament Right in Revelation chapter 21, in the vision given to Apostle John, he said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, 
coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So you could see that the symbolism attached to the place of Jerusalem is so significant to the mind of the Jews. So for Nehemiah, the pitiful state of Jerusalem reflects badly the God they worship. Remember, it's 90 years after the first return of the remnants. It is 70 years after the completion of the temple. And yet, the place is still in such a destitute condition. People, God's people, are living in such a disgraceful way. And the city, the war, is in such a way that it is broken down, the gates are burned, and no one cares to rebuild or to replace them. Hence, Nehemiah, his concern is more than just his own race, but the honor of God in the eyes of the world. This is a good reflection, isn't it? What concerns do we have? Yes, we do have many concerns every day, but how high is God's honor and the welfare of God's people ranked in your list of concerns? Yes, we get upset when we hear God's name being abused. Yes, we get sad and uh, perhaps you know, even cried when we see Christians suffered in the hands of the ungodly for their faith in Jesus. But Nehemiah's concern for God's honor and God's people was so deep that he could not shake it off. He cannot put it down. For some days, he wept. He mourned. He fasted and prayed. So much so that his sadness was noticed by the king in chapter 2 of verse 1, which is four months since he heard of this report. Now, fasting, fasting, a biblical fasting is a temporary abstinence from food in order that the person who fasts can focus his or her mind in search of God in prayers and in reflections. There are many biblical examples of God's people turning to God in fasting and praying. For example, in the book of Esther, Esther asked all the Jews to join her in fasting and praying when the survival of the entire Jewish race was at stake. Now Nehemiah cares for the honor of God's people and the honor of God so much that he fasted and prayed during this period. And uh, what does he pray for? And next, the next slide shows us he was praying on behalf of God's community. In verse 5, in the prayer he said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servants, Moses. Now please note from these three verses, verse 5 to 7, 
Nehemiah was praying to God in his, as a first person. He's using I. Right? Please be attentive to hear your servant is praying, I. But then he's praying for, not himself alone, but for the community of God's people. For he says in verse 6, for your servants, the people of Israel, for God's people. And secondly, he's making confessions to God, not only for his personal sin, but for the sin of the entire community, past and present. For, we said, for he said, the sins that we have committed, including myself, my father's family, right, and uh, the ancestors as well. So it is fair to see that he's actually carrying God's people in his prayer. He's carrying the community to God, although he is not a priest. He's neither a prophet. He's only a lay person serving in the palace as a cupbearer. Now, I think there's so, so much we can learn from the scripture um, in our modern, uh, in the setting of our modern culture. In our Western modern uh, culture, we see th things in a very much personal, individualistic way, right? So even our salvation is very much focused on our personal salvation which is true, our focus is our personal family. When we mention family, usually we have in mind of the man and the wife and the immediate children, the nucleus family. And uh, yes, you know, we still keep in touch with our parents and the siblings, but they are somehow, especially the siblings, are extended families, right? So, you know, our life goes around this nucleus family. At the center, our individual personal concern. But in the Bible, we see that very often a person is so much aware that he is a member of a large community. So for the Israelites, they consider themselves not as only they are God's people, but they are a member of God's community. There is a sense of solidarity, a sense of belonging. So they rise and fall together as God's people. Now in the New Testament, you can see that thought is being extended to the oneness in Christ, right? So it, it goes beyond the racial and the political and social barriers. In Christ, there is no Jews or Gentiles, no rich or poor, no male or female, masters or slaves, for we are all together redeemed, saved people in Christ. So I think the biblical understanding actually tells us a great deal. And uh, when a person sins, yes, the person is responsible, but the entire Christian family suffers. And they, so this reminds us of the great responsibility as, a, as an individual in God's community. There's a responsibility to watch out for one another and to build one another up in Christ. Christian must care about God's people and God's honor and God's church as we are one of God's people. Now, let's come back to Nehemiah. So, in the mind of Nehemiah, what has gone wrong, right? And uh, not only Nehemiah, for the entire remnants, 
living in exile, they would have time to reflect on what has actually happened to them. For example, the destruction of the temple, how they came to the fallen land in exile, and how God has kept them together. And even though the number is small, the remnants were able to return to Jerusalem 90 years ago. And then they reflect 70 years ago, the temple was built. But the question is, is the covenant with God still in force? If the covenant is still in force, why Jerusalem is still in ruins? And why the remnants are living in disgrace? So I think it is fair to read that Nehemiah must be going through this in his weeping, mourning, fasting and praying. And he comes to this crunch. Yes, in his prayer, he's not just asking for God's mighty work to, 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 to build a temple for them. His concern was, look, we need to come back to God and to confess their wrongs. Yes, sin is a serious matter, especially sin against God. That's why in verse 6, he said, I confess the sins we Israelites have committed against you. Yes, in verse 7, we God's people as a whole have acted wickedly towards you, our God. Yes, we have ignored, we have obeyed your word given through your servant, Moses. The only way back to God is through confession and repentance. Confession before intercession or even supplication. Yes, we confess in our prayers, but sometimes I feel that we confess only in a very vague way. Our confession is taken too lightly, or oh, forgive my sin, and then we just roll on to something else. Now, for Nehemiah, his confession is very specific, it refers to what they have gone wrong. And they have sinned against God. They have, especially the ancestors, they have turned away and worship idols. They acted in a wicked way, not only religiously, but socially. They have neglected the poor. They have actually take advantage of the weak, the fatherless, the widow. Look at the list of uh, wrongs listed in the book of Amos. God was telling them, look, you come to me with sacrifice, you come to me with all the religious languages in prayer, but what are you doing among yourselves? Are you living out as God's people? And that's why Nehemiah recognized the only thing back to God is, firstly, through confession and repentance. Next, the next slide shows us that he knows that, look, they dare not ask for anything more than God's mercy and his grace. And in verse 8, he said, remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen as a place for my name. Now, if you look at these two verses, Nehemiah only bring out the covenant that God has given to his people through Moses. 
right? Yes, it was, it was God who rescued their ancestor from the hands of the Egyptians and gave them the promised land. And they express their faith on the Lord as their God, as they are God's people, they belong to God alone. And that's what he's saying. Look, in verse 10, they are your people, they are your servants, whom you redeem by your great strength and mighty hand. So if you look at these kind of languages, he's saying in his prayer, Lord, we can only turn to you seeking your grace because you are covenantal, you are a faithful God. We don't deserve any, 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 anything more than your punishment. That's why he reminded them. Uh, he reminded himself and God's people through this prayer. God says, if you are unfaithful, God's punishment will come upon them. And it did in the form of exile. But in the same way, God has raised up Cyrus, the Persian king to give them the opportunity to come back to Jerusalem. Now we have no time to look at Cyrus in the book of um, Isaiah because Cyrus was actually described as God's anointed servant. God is actually working out his plan through a foreign king. Now look at his uh, prayer. There's no mention of the Jerusalem war. There's no request for God's direct action towards the remnants in in uh, Jerusalem. But he can only mention that the covenant that God has given to God's people through Moses. So the next, we turn to his last sentence in his prayer. It shows Nehemiah's great commitment to God's people and to rebuild God's honor in the place of Jerusalem. He says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant, that's himself, and to the prayers of your servants, so other people too will be surely praying for God's honor and the welfare of God's people. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Now in his memoir, he didn't give a great details of what he was in his mind at that, in, in his prayer. But we know in chapter two and the later events unfold that he was actually asking God for his return to Jerusalem to rebuild the broken city wall. Now, but before he could do so, he needs to, to, be, to, to get away. In other words, he needs the king's permission to grant him leave from work so that he can go back to Jerusalem. Now, Let's just consider what options has he got. Now, going back to Jerusalem is the most difficult and important decisions for him. Perhaps if he sits down and work out the pros and cons, there may be other options. Perhaps he can give financially and perhaps he can use his connection to introduce some skill builders, some experienced project manager for the rebuilding of the wall. And also another option, he can pray, pray for support. And that's what we normally said, isn't it? We pray for one another. Yes, we do that. Now, again, there are also many reasons for him to say, well, yes, I will just pray and I will give, I will help you to find a good builder, project manager, 
who can take the task forward, but it's not for me. I'm sorry, I cannot commit to myself because A, I'm living a thousand kilometers away, B, I'm tied to the job, and B, C, the king has to allow me to leave even if I want to go. Now, he himself is putting forward to a task which is really, really difficult, demanding and dangerous. And I'm sure when he sat down and worked out, there would be costs involved as well. Firstly, there will be a personal sacrifice of his lifestyle. He has to give up living in the most luxurious place on earth at that time, the royal palace. He has to give up his prestigious position as a cupbearer, trusted by the king, the most powerful person in the empire. And what, the, what other costs involve? He has to work hard in a place where there is no one he can trust. Again, we will see that later. And then C, yes, his working away is going to be a long time. He actually works and stay in Judah for 12 years. Fourthly, what other personal costs involve? He was accused, he was threatened, and he was spy on, and for a period he has to carry his weapon in his sleep with his with his uniform and armor. You, you can you can imagine the, uh, the, the, the the dangerous position he was in when he was in Judah. And fifthly, most importantly, the personal risk being misunderstood by the king for his for his intention. Remember in Ezra chapter 4, when the opposition wrote to the king after Caesar's, and, uh, and it was the same king who gave the reply and said, let's stop the rebuilding of the city, right? So he is going to ask for the king to revert more or less his previous edict for allowing him to go back and rebuild the city wall. Now, why bother to ask for such a dangerous task? I think the answer is, has got to be his concern for God's glory and the welfare of God's people, that he is willing to put himself out and to commit to this task. It is not for faint-hearted. He was determined to go himself and to see to the task for God's honor. So today, is there any significance of this event to us? Is God asking us to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple or to build a big church, a super structure for him? No, because as I said earlier on, although Jerusalem has, a, has, has its own symbolic and spiritual meaning attached to it, there is this discontinuity and continuity in Jerusalem seen as a place of God's glory. Firstly, this continuity. There is no need to attach to God's glory to a place. There is no need to fight for Jerusalem and to look and, and, and to build a church to show God's glory in a physical place. For we read in, Re uh, in Revelation 21, we look forward to a new Jerusalem when a new heaven, a new earth arrives, right? And in Revelation 21, God's dwelling place is now among the people, right? So in other words, God's dwelling is no longer 
in a place, Jerusalem. But God's dwelling is, is the people rather than the place. It's among God's people. So in other words, God's glory is not reflected by how beautiful Jerusalem is. But God's glory is, is expressed through how beautiful, how holy God's people are. So there's a continuity. Yes, God's honor is attached to God's people. And God, the welfare of God's people must be the concern of every godly person who profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. So the application for us is very clearly the continuity of God's honor and the good of God's people should be our paramount concern. Is that your personal concern too? Now, in the account of Nehemiah, we saw how he carried the entire community of God's people in his prayer. How far are we willing to carry God's people in our prayer, in our supplications? Does the poor spiritual condition of God's people cause us to come before God in tears? Are we weeping and mourning over the worldliness among God's redeemed people? I think there is a need for us to come before God to confess and to confess the sin of turning a blind eye to the brokenness of God's people and also God's glory. Thirdly, in Nehemiah, because of his concern for God's glory and God's people, he's willing to commit himself at a great cost to himself. Commitment to God also costs us too. Commitment to God's people also involves sacrificing that we have to make in order that people may be built up and encouraged. Let us take heart. Let us be one of the Nehemiahs that God can raise up and use in our modern time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have used the record of Nehemiah to inspire us. Lord, we confess to you that very often we seek our own honor and our own interest. And Lord, we confess to you that our concern for you is shallow and our concern for your people is only temporary and it's not adequate. Lord, we pray that Lord, you help us to refocus our eyes through Christ. Lord, we give you thanks that you have come to rescue us through the giving of your only son, through his death on the cross, that our sins are paid, and through him that we have been brought back and received into your family as your people. Lord, we give you thanks that we are living in a comparatively safe and comfortable environment. Lord, we remember those of other brothers and sisters who may be living under some hostile regime. They have to work hard and, uh, and their lives also are in danger because of their faith in you. Lord, we pray for your protection. Lord, we pray that you will continue to show your people of your grace and your comfort in their distress. Lord, we also pray that you help us to use our resources in an intelligent way so that, Lord, 
your people might be built up, not only financially, practically, but also spiritually. Lord, we pray that you help us to rebuild ourselves before you in our devotion. Lord, help us to draw close to you through fasting and praying. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us, will convict us, and will empower us in our spiritual journey. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.